Welcome to my country. Welcome to my country. Welcome to my country. Welcome. Meet my ancestors. 180 million years young. My culture is everywhere around me. My country is incredible, from its deserts to its seas. Come walk with my ancestors on my homeland. I would like to acknowledge the indigenous people of this great nation, Australia. From Aboriginal nation to make up this land. The traditional custodians of this land. Let us all pay our respect to our elders, past and present, and those in the future. Come, walk with us, connect with us, and become part of our dreaming. Thank you. So we would like to welcome you all um, to our webinar today. And um, we are coming to you from Brisbane, uh, which is Yagara and Turrbal country. And we just invite you to do an, a little introduction into the chat. Uh, and tell us the, the country that you're um, working from today. Um, and if you don't know that, then that's your first piece of homework from the session is to find out. So um, please feel free to pop that into the chat now. We look forward to seeing where everybody's uh, from today. And then um, once you've done that, we're going to um, open a poll just to get you get some more information about where you're coming from. So um, Steph will be putting that up on the screen. Um, there are a few questions, so you might need to just use the little scroll bar to, to find the bottom of that section there and answer those. So we're always interested to know where people are coming from. And we, we may well have a number from the, the lockdown areas who just needed some uh, interaction today, <laughs> but we welcome you here. Um, we uh, just wanted to introduce the team while you're doing that. So uh, we have PCC for You uh, National Project Manager, which is Kylie Ash, who's here on screen, and Steph Dickinson, who is my learning and development counterpart, is uh, in the busy seat doing the technical side of things today. So thanks for that, Steph. Uh, we have people here from Perth. Is that Wadjuk country? Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Uh, we've got Janine, who's on the Gadigal land of the Aura Nation, Tracy in Victoria, Unurong Boon Wurrung, and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people's land. Bunjalung country, Kulin Nation, press send too soon. <laughs> okay, so Tracy's well aware of those various representatives of traditional owners. That's fantastic. So we really appreciate you um, taking the time to put that in there. All right, we might move along and get started with our, um, our topic presentation today. So I'm just going to, we are um, looking today at culturally responsive care. And before we get into the specific um, topic of culturally responsive palliative care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, I just wanted to um, set the scene a little bit and look at what do we uh, what do we mean when we say culturally responsive care? So the Indigenous Allied Health Association of Australia has um, put together their cultural responsiveness in action framework. This was developed to in response to a need for practical strategies to strengthen the capability of individuals and agencies who are tasked with the responsibility of providing culturally safe and responsive care to meet the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And the framework um, is a transformative framework and in, incorporates knowledge or knowing, self-knowledge and behaviour of being and action doing. And they describe cultural responsiveness as the how-to of cultural safety and say that feeling culturally safe is the experience of the care recipient and not something that's defined by the caregiver. It requires students and healthcare services to develop cultural competence. So with that in mind, I just wanted to find out from you, um, in your current learning programs, whether that be um, education in university sector, uh, workshops, learning modules, what content do your learners already cover on this topic? So you might have a subject on Indigenous health and wellbeing, you might have cultural safety, 
uh, content. Um, and I just get, I'm gonna get you to type that up onto the screen. So you can do that using your annotate uh, function in Zoom. So um, in your little toolbar of Zoom tools, you'll have one with a, a pencil icon and you can just use that and uh, click annotate. And then you'll be able to use the text tool to, to type onto that screen, or you can freehand um, write if you're really good with your mouse control. Um, but I would recommend the, the text. So um, somebody's got the hang of it there already. That's fantastic. So just give you a couple of minutes um, to think about. This really just is getting us thinking about the topic um, to start with and, and where we already have curriculum um, resources that, that center on this. So now I would like to introduce our wonderful guest speaker for the day. Um, it's Nicole Hewlett, who is our Indigenous um, PEPA manager, national manager, and um, a member of the Indigenous advisory group that supports PCC for you. And she's very kindly agreed to share um, her knowledge with us today. And we're going to have um, about 20 minutes where we can have um, a fairly open conversation with Nicole. We've, we've um, put some questions to her already, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions um, as we go through and just encourage you to, I guess, prepare that by jotting it down or you can put it into the chat and we'll be having a, a look at that. So um, thank you, Nicole, and welcome. Thank you. Um, I just want to say hi, you mob, and the, um, Nicole Hewlett, and I'm a proud Palawa woman from Lotawida in Tasmania, and I present to you today from Turrbal and Yagara lands of Mianjin in Brisbane. Um, I'd like to pay my deepest respect to elders past, present and emerging of this beautiful country and extend this same respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who's watching this today. Thank you. Um, now, I'm just gonna get you to start off by telling us a bit about the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Is our map up on screen? Awesome. Um, so as you can see, if you have a look at the map here, it's a map of all the different Aboriginal language groups that we have here in Australia. And there are about roughly 300 and each community varies not only according to geographic location, environment and resources, but uh, they each have their own unique cultural practices, histories, languages, beliefs, knowledge and kinship systems. And even within these communities, there are significant variability and nuances with families within each community and the song lines that get handed down. So you can imagine how, given the diversity, how overwhelming it can be when someone is asked to speak on behalf of all of Aboriginal peoples. Um, you can only ever do that sort of thing in a very vague and broad sense. Um, and then when we add our Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, um, then well, they may as well be in a completely different country and culture altogether. And I, I certainly cannot speak on behalf of these mob um, any more than I could speak on behalf of, say, a Chinese person. Um, but I do pass on information and advocate on their behalf when I have their permission. That's great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the things, given that, that we've talked about diversity already, but what are some of the things that are similar across cultures um, in terms of understanding health and well-being? I suppose, I mean, one of the very similar things that I'm sure everyone's aware of is that it is our history of oppression and dispossession, um, which meant for a lot of us denying our identity in order to be classified as human or as a citizen of Australia so that we could access privileges and a better life. And I suppose given this you know, history of colonisation, it, it's really important to emphasise that if someone um, identifies as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander, it does not necessarily mean that they're automatically connected to culture, country and kinship. Um, the stolen generations, for example, meant that many Aboriginal kids were removed from their families and communities and, and raised to be non-Indigenous with no information given to them about their heritage. So I just wanted to premise with that before I talk about some of the similarities across our cultures traditionally. Um, so traditionally, and for a lot of us Aboriginal people today and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, even those that have taken on uh, other introduced religions like Christianity, um, our beliefs 
around health and well-being are grounded in a sense of belonging. So it's a belonging to land, to see other people, to one's culture. So many of us believe that we come from the land and when we pass, we go back to the land um, and that we are all on this, we are all spirits and we're on this life, death, life continuum. Um, and if you can see on, there's a artwork which sort of captures um, that life, death, life continuum done by Uncle Mick Connolly there. Um, many of us believe that all living things, so people, animals, plants, rocks, all have a spirit and that these spirits connect to the living, to the past, present and the future. Um, and that we, including myself, are connected to our ancestors through things like country and ceremony and even ourselves with our stories. Um, and we're also connected to the ancestors of the future because we are the ancestors of the future. So you can see why country is so significant to us. It is our connection to our past in terms of our ancestors. It's, it's important to our present day in terms of our health that it's connected to us through our future. In Aboriginal society, everything and everyone is interrelated, it's interconnected, the land, family, stars, there's a oneness and this is what we call the dreaming. Um, for Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, their spirituality tends to draw more upon stories of Tagai. So given this perspective, our health and well-being is extremely holistic, as you can tell, and it's transcendent. And when it comes to palliative care, many of us need to return to spirit back to country in order for that life death life journey to continue. Um, different communities have different protocols and ceremonies around that, but traditionally the life death life continuum and the relationship to country um, is, is a similar um, theme across all of our cultures. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And I just noticed the comment in the chat. This is so beautiful. So oh, that's really, good. <laughs> really appreciate what you're sharing, Nicole. That's and I, sh I should also add to that, that if mm -hmm. um, just because if someone's not on country, so if an Aboriginal person like myself um, no longer lives on traditional country, that um, in no way does that diminish our cultural and spiritual connections to country. Um, I think that's important to note as well, because I think a lot of people assume that, oh, well, you given that significant connection to country, um, you expect people to always be on country, but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, so what are some of the barriers that prevent um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from accessing palliative care services? Well, in, from our um, a cultural point of view, I'll go into more of the um, uh, other barriers in the next question, but similar to a lot of cultures, some of us hold the belief that everything happens for a reason. So if you have cancer, it's because you've done something wrong to invite that sickness. And often mob don't want to share about that because then they will be judged and community will assume that they've done something um, to have that particular condition or illness. Um, there's also the idea of manifestation. So by somehow talking about it, you then make it uh, more of a reality. You bring it forward somehow, you manifest it. Um, and so if we talk about death and dying or we'll try to prepare, then somehow we have now brought that closer to us because we've talked about it. That's good. Sorry, I jumped ahead and asked you the, the next question on the list. So you've answered, <laughs> you've answered the one you were meant to answer. The, well done. <laughs> So in terms of, um, of barriers then, what prevents uh, people accessing palliative care? Um, obviously there's those beliefs that, um, if, you know, that that would influence that, but what other barriers are there that exist? Well, at the heart, I mean, there are, there are many barriers, but I'll, for, in my opinion, I think at the heart of those barriers are these two main ones. Um, there's racism in the health system, um, and then there's community awareness and education of what palliative care is. Um, so we all know there's endless literature on the experience of racism in the health systems for our mob, and um, so many of us have received culturally unsafe and poorer carer or no care at all as a result of being Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. Um, and this is a systemic barrier across the nation because these institutions are non-Indigenous and therefore they're intrinsically built in non-Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. Um, and that's often at odds um, with our ways. So in terms of um, our community, we've, we've been doing palliative care 
and looking after our elders and those that are sick since the dawn of time. But we don't call it palliative care. It's not our language and we don't actually have a word for it. Um, those that are familiar with the word palliative, they have very terrible experiences that are associated with that word. And those experiences are in, whether it be by ho in hospitals or um, by individuals, and these sorts of experiences and stories flood our grapevines in every community. And now that we have things like Facebook and the like, those stories are faster and more serious than they've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, and so for many, the word palliative care is quite stigmatised and there is often a lot of misunderstanding of what it, what it actually is. Um, and for those that have or are a little bit familiar with it, it's often associated with negative things like death, pain, loss, trauma. Um, and so a lot of mobs tend to steer quite clear um, of anything to do with palliative, the word, if palliative is in it. Um, and they refer to the workforce often as the Grim Reaper workforce. Um, and this often means that our communities are caring for sick family members uh, and they're caring for them alone without any sort of support and without resources. Um, and that's one thing that IPEPA is, you know, hoping to change as we move forward. Mm. Yeah, I think you mentioned a story to me last week when we were having this conversation about the um, an example of one of an auntie in dialysis. Do you want to just share that story just to illustrate? Yeah, that? yeah. So on a lot of these um, grapevines, there is you know every day there would be a new person um, filming about their experience in in hospital or in, with a particular um, service. Um, and this one uh, was of an auntie getting dialysis. And even though it wasn't the nurse uh, treating her, she overheard a conversation um, of a gentleman in the bed next to her. And the nurse um, was talking to him and he was referring to abos, this abos, that in a very derogative sort of way. Um, and the nurse sort of chimed in. And even though, you know, the nurse was probably looking to make her client um, comfortable, our mob are hearing this um, and it gives this man and it gives her this permission to use words like this, which are very derogative to us. And it, it makes for a very culturally unsafe atmosphere for us. Yeah, I guess that illustrates the point about cultural safety being the experience of the person and not you know, something that you do. It's, it's how that how a person feels in that care. And it's with everyone because you yeah. never know who's listening and it, it adds to the culture of a place, um, those sorts of things that are allowed to continue and those sorts of conversations that are not pulled up. Yeah. Um, and, and people, including kids, are listening to these um, things. And so, you know, there is a responsibility for all of us in all of our interactions to be culturally safe, regardless of whether the person that you are um, talking to or caring for is Aboriginal or not. Mm. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, what would, what's the most important thing that health professional students, particularly those, um, you know, in their entry to practice or undergraduate courses, what, what is the most important thing that they need to learn in mm, order to be able to go on? I could go all day on this one. So <laughs> it's, it's hard to one thing. Think it's one, one thing. One thing. Um, Probably for entry to practice, deep, genuine listening. Um, you are at the start of your entry to practice journey. So I imagine that you'd be going through various culturally responsive courses and you'll understand, you'll you know, begin to understand the importance of critical reflection in unpacking things like unconscious bias, et cetera. But when it comes to our mob and providing tailored culturally responsive care, there will be no lesson like the lesson you get from having Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander person sitting in front of you and you really listening to them. Often, you know, if you're an entry to practice, you might be quite nervous and caught up in your head about everything that you've learned and you're trying to recall acronyms of how to be appropriate and, and you're playing it all out at once. So should I look at them in the eyeballs? Should I not? Should I, you know, <laughs> hug them, kumbaya, whatever. You've got a circus of things going on in your head and that can often disconnect you um, because you lose the realness because you're caught up in your head. Um, for us and for many cultures, storytelling is, is a beautiful bridge to building intimacy, trust and connection. So when you have the privilege of a, 
sitting in front of and caring for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, share your story. No, and not, not your professional one. We don't care if you graduated from Apple University or have a deadly Instagram account with five stars. We want to connect with you. Like, where did you come from? Who's your family? Why are you here today sitting in front of me? And then tell me that you know nothing about my journey and that you're here to listen and learn. And I think it's, it's really as simple as that at this, at this stage. That's great. That's a really good one thing. <laughs> Not an easy one thing. But I probably good... snuck like 20 things in there, but you know. <laughs> it's a good thing to remember. Thank you. Um, so we have um, some time now for questions for Nicole, and I'm sure you all have some burning questions to ask. Um, I'm going to ask you to use your raise hand button on Zoom if you would like to ask a question. Um, I hope everyone can find that. Apparently, there's just been a Zoom update, so it might be in a different place um, to where it normally is, but it's in the reactions uh, little tab. So I know um, to get us started that um, Kylie has a, a question. So I'll let her kick that one off. Yes, I'm new. Hi, Nick. Quite often in my role, I'm approached by academics who are non-Indigenous and they're not comfortable or they don't feel they should be teaching some of this content. Would you like to comment on that? I think, I mean, we're only 3% of the population. So, you know, there will come a time where, yeah, you do have to, you know, teach this because there's not someone available to do it. Uh, and it's not a good enough excuse not to teach about these sorts of things or not to teach black history in schools because it's not done by an Aboriginal person. Obviously in an ideal world, yet yeah, by an Aboriginal person is great, but I think there is a lot of benefit in a non-Indigenous person and their journey of learning in this space as well that your students can relate to. And, and I think sharing that journey and also with the, you know, with the premise that you know, you are obviously are not Aboriginal and you cannot speak on behalf of all of this, but this is what you do know so far. And if there are any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room, um, invite them to, to have some input if they feel comfortable to do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Nick. I think it is important for um, everyone to acknowledge that. And as you say, there are very limited numbers of Indigenous academics. Mm. Absolutely. Suzanne's made a lovely comment in the chat box there about how um, incorporating the environment um, can help people feel welcomed and culturally included. Um, Suzanne, did you want to read your comment? Uh, yes, sorry. So I grew up um, in the Northern Territory and so um, and started my health career in the Northern Territory, both in um, Darwin and Catherine and Alice Springs. So I know that although that there are some magnificent hospitals there that are built on, you know, hospitals that look like they are down south. Some of them are built specifically for the Indigenous population. And so the Catherine Hospital was one of them and it had a huge um, veranda all out the front because um, a lot of your patients would invariably not want to sit in their beds all day and they'd all go outside. And so it was very inclusive in that way. So I, I feel like I've been very privileged and I like the way, Nick, that you've talked about um, saying that you what you don't know um, but in particular talking about your own story and listening to the story because I've learned most of what I know from actually doing stuff and being there rather than actually having to listen to academics try and tell me what it's like but I think hearing other people's stories whether they're from your own culture or someone else's culture has been my greatest learning um, with caring for Indigenous people yeah that's beautiful Suzanne thank you have we got any other um, questions? Oh, we have um, a question in the chat from Janine. Um, Nick, you spoke of song lines before. I'm hearing that term more often with an expectation that the general population know what it means and the importance of it. Can you explain what song lines means for us? Yeah, so I suppose in, in the, the weave of life um, and in a lot of our storytelling, there's this belief that each of us have, like, I suppose in, in English, it would be my, like your destiny. So each of us have a destiny um, and we're part of the fabric um, that we're guided by our ancestors. 
um, and this forms our song line. So it, it is what we dedicate our life to. Um, so a lot would say that, you know, my song line is in palliative care. So I need to make a certain, as part of my song line or a part of my life cycle and my physical presence in this particular life, um, I need to do certain things um, as part of that song line so that the next song line can, can begin, um, which might be my kids or whatever, whoever, whoever else is crossing my song line path. So it's almost like a life path. Does that make sense? It's probably not, it does, I don't know if I can explain it as well. Um, the English language is, becomes quite limited at times when you're talking about things like that are associated with dreaming and with the Aboriginal cultures. It's because a lot of it's not oral. It's, it's yeah, beyond that, yeah. Thank you, that is, that's good to, good to know. Any other questions um, at the moment? Uh, Narelle says, Nick, I'm working in Palliative care. I'm trying to work on bringing country to patients who aren't able to go home. Any ideas there? Yeah, um, some people uh, actually get a jar of country from um, where they're from and bring it in, and that that's had some beautiful effects for a lot. Um, other people show videos or have crackling fire, um, so they use digital technology to bring country into the room, and and that's one of the beautiful things about you know digital technologies these days. It's so realistic. Um, and so that can often have the same um, experience as connecting um, in person to country. So um, yeah, take advantage and, and offer that to your, um, to your clients wherever you can, because you'll be surprised at um, yeah, how, how significant such seemingly small things can be. And I know I'm um, just listening to the, watching the Palliative Care Australia um, webinar that was on recently for NAIDOC week. Mm. There's a few conversations about um, how to bring country to people and some of the things you've mentioned too. So um, yeah, we recommend that one, Narelle, as well. Um, what was it called? Uh, footprint, Final Footprints? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Final Footprints is a new video resource that Palliative Care Australia has just um, put out, but the webinar around that was um, done on, in NAIDOC week and I think it was having a yarn or something was the title. So you should be able to find that in there. Um, we've got time for one or two more questions. And um, Suzanne says, I wonder if there's an opportunity for virtual country to be used using virtual 3D apps. Yeah, bring it on. I guess mm. the sky's the limit, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and another question about, um, is there generally a fear of death in Indigenous culture or a welcoming and about the spirit world and interaction with past ones? I think I mean, I can't speak on behalf of everyone. For some, absolutely. It's not dissimilar to every other culture. Yes, there's going to be some people that have a, um, particularly those that perhaps uh, subscribe more to things like Christianity, where this concept of hell now exists. Um, you know, traditionally we didn't have these um, concepts in, in our culture. So hell wasn't a thing. So there wasn't anything to fear, but now we've introduced religion, yeah, there are certainly communities that now have got a fear because there is um, the possibility of something else now that's much worse. Um, but yeah, but while for others, it's um, it's still that life, death, life continuum that we go back to country and we continue our journey. Um, I know I, I believe that. So for me, um, passing will be as much as a celebration or as much um, sort of ceremony as my birth into into the physical world. If we if we're teaching a course and it, and of health professional students and we have indigenous um, students in the course, we realise that um, that conversations around death and dying and palliative care can be very sensitive business, and um, also that you know there are um, it, there's a different cultural perspective. So I guess what would you suggest for educators? Um, in terms of including those people in, in, in the learning the best way? Well, I think exactly doing that, like acknowledging that there are sensitivities because you're not just talking to Aboriginal people. There are a lot of cultures with these sorts of sensitivities. Mm. So I imagine when you're presenting, um, you know, education in this space, it's the same as delivering palliative care. You need to think about the entire context, um, which is 
the people that are involved and how to acknowledge it at the same time as going, this is part of your work now. Um, I imagine if someone has selected to be coming into palliative care that they've already um, gone through all of the process of, in their own minds around talking about death and dying um, and they've, you know, and that's why they're here. Mm. Mm. Thank you. So it's definitely important to acknowledge and, and also to invite, you know, different perspectives. Like give yeah. people an opportunity to talk about it from their point of view because there's a lot of learning that can happen um, in a two-way kind of experience for other students in there uh, yeah. in the same classroom. Great, thank you. Um, we also have um, some resources that Nicole's just put together on this slide, which are all freely available um, and recommended resources um, to help uh, your learning and teaching in this in this content. Um, we'll put that slide up on our um, resource hub on the educator community um, section of the LMS so you can access those. Um, but yeah, just wanted to say a huge thank you, Nicole, for sharing your um, your knowledge and your um, your experience with us and for doing it in such an open um, and sensitive way. So really appreciate um, if we could give you a round of applause, we would, but it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit challenging. I'm sensing the standing ovation. Sarah. Yeah, no take, just take that. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And Nicole's going to hang around for the rest of the webinar too. So if you did um, have some questions of follow up, we might get some time at the end to um, to talk about that. So I'll just shut myself up now. <laughs> So we're just going to um, spend a few moments now um, talking about one of the PCC for You resources that we have um, on this area. Uh, you may be familiar with our focus topic two resource, uh, caring for Aboriginal people with life limiting illness. Um, it's currently in our PCC for You core modules and focus topics, which is on the website. Um, we've identified um, over recent times that uh, this resource is really um, in need of improvement. So we are embarking currently on um, a redevelopment. So in terms of the redevelopment, we're going to um, turn this into a focus topic toolkit. So it will provide a greater breadth of resources and options for learning activities, which will allow um, educators to individualise learning for their students. Um, we intend to re-edit the case study videos, Tom's story, which you might be familiar with, um, and include some expert commentary at various points to highlight um, some aspects of the interactions that do or do not reflect um, best practice in terms of culturally responsive care and how and give some suggestions for ways that it could be improved. We're also going to include some other video resources um, from Palliative Care Australia, for example, um, to integrate into the learning activities and hopefully provide a more diverse cultural viewpoint and some better examples of culturally responsive care. So that's the intention. Um, the aims, in terms of aims and objectives, it'll be based on the core principles of palliative care and they will link, to, um, as the current module does, to the core, core module one activities. Um, we're, as I said, aiming to provide a range of activities and resources for educators to use. And we have um, been involved in a consultation process on this. So just as a reminder, this, the resource we're providing is not intended to replace your existing curriculum on cultural safety or Indigenous health and wellbeing, but it's intended to focus specifically on providing culturally responsive palliative care. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. <clears throat> our consultation process to date has included um, presenting our plans for redevelopment to uh, within our existing networks, including the PCC for You National Indigenous Advisory Group, the Palliative Care Australia Yarning Circle, and then informally with our IPEPA colleagues. Uh, so today we wanted to provide you as the learning and teaching experts um, with a bit of an overview and get some ideas from you about how it could be used in practice. Uh, the learning outcomes, which I'm just going to give you a, an overview of, um, are aligned to sort of key national frameworks. So the Indigenous Allied Health uh, Australia Cultural Responsiveness Framework, the Knowing, Being and Doing, the Graduate Capabilities in Palliative Care, and then the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Curriculum Framework. 
<clears throat> so the first three activities uh, center around knowing, uh, and we are looking at um, some critical reflection on power, privilege, and the institutional place of health services, and how that impacts on uh, provision of palliative care. We also want to have a, a look at traditional kinship systems and connections to country and culture, and how that influences the views that people have on health and well-being. And we also um, have an activity looking at the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and what that means also for palliative care in our context. And you can see there how they are aligned to the different frameworks. And then the other three activities um, involve being and doing. So we have an activity that looks, that'll look at the historical and ongoing trauma that contributes to barriers. Um, we'll also then have um, an activity around communication and delivering family-centred care, and then um, one on recognising cultural considerations. So some very practical um, activities there at, in those last couple. So with that in mind, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts and ideas um, in terms of the content that would best help support your learning and teaching practice in palliative care. So I, I guess what I'm seeing there is that, that most of that is quite important. Um, if there's something there you think we've missed, then um, obviously you can just feed that back by putting it in the chat or you can write a text comment there. Um, is that somebody trying to talk? Just got a couple of comments there in the chat section as well, Sharon. Okay, I can't see my chat at the moment. So, okay, so uh, one of the first ones was um, uh, family centered care, UN rights, Indigenous beliefs, views in health, and um, institutional trust. And that's from Nara. Thanks for that. Uh, I think it, it probably looks like we've got our content about right. Um, if you come up, if you if you think there's something missing, we really wish you'd include something on that and get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you about that. Um, okay, so we'll just um, move on to our next little activity there. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps at some point we'll have to come back to the UN Declaration of Rights. That's probably something that um, we need to, it, it's interesting that comment has come up that needs to have some further clarification. Yeah, that, that is something that you don't actually see included in a lot of the, the content um, at the moment. It's something that um, certainly is um, being talked about more often and we thought it would be helpful to include it in our toolkit for that reason, uh, just to say that students are aware of, of the declaration and what that means um, in terms of uh, a rights-based approach to, to health um, and palliative care in particular. Um, okay, we'll just move on. We've got another um, question for you. Um, <clears throat> and I have to move those stamps so that we can get new stamps happening. Um, so we've talked about content in terms of resources that we can provide to support um, learning and teaching in palliative care. What are going to be the most helpful things um, that we can provide? Yep, we know that video is a popular one and it's so helpful um, to be able to tell the stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. If you can't have them come to a, a lecture and present, but you can show videos and those videos can be used over again. And we've um, certainly had some very generous uh, people give, given their time to, and to, to share their stories for the benefit of our learning. So um, that uh, does look like a very, a very popular one there. Um, and again, if you've got other content or other suggestions, um, please just pop them in a text comment. Uh, I can see that um, activities and thinking points are um, clearly a, a popular uh, resource as well. So we will be uh, incorporating thinking points into our uh, toolkit resources, just as we have with our other PCC view modules. Um, thank you for um, 
for participating in that. Appreciate hearing from you. And we want to make sure that the resources we provide um, are beneficial and that they're useful. Um, it's just want to, interesting to know whether who, who in the room currently uses the the focus topic to uh, focus topic resource in their teaching. Um, is anybody you can say yes in the chat or you can put your hand up. Um, so you you currently use the focus topic to resource. Is that right, Suzanne? Yeah, I use a couple yep. of them, but I really do like Tom's story, and I've just put that in the um, you know, the yeah. chat. I, I like it, but I do agree, and I'm looking forward to the next version of it. I think that there's opportunity though to have some more um, palliative care from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives woven throughout all of the modules, rather than just having a specific focus. Um, I, that's how you know, and I think a lot of the cultural stuff you, we do have cultural stuff throughout. PCC for you, but maybe um, some more Indigenous Aboriginal stuff uh, included throughout. Mm. Okay, that's a good comment. Thank you. Um, great. I just, I know this is, can I just say, um, I really, really enjoy, and I know this is um, about Aboriginal um, palliative care and health care, but um, Bassam's story that you have there for PCC for you is mm. an absolute standout. So something like that as well um, with Aboriginal um, peoples, I think would be absolutely, you know, um, of great use because I think that the way that that story is told, and if we're talking about storytelling, I mm. think it's a brilliant way of, of getting across how it actually affects individuals and families, um, you know, wonderfully. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a great, it's a really good resource, that um, video. And we certainly do have other resources um, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander palliative care that we can include in our um, toolkit, which we will be doing. So yeah, they are very, very much um, needed. So just in terms of um, wrapping up our conversation on this topic um, and having some take home messages, I guess, uh, we all we agree that it's important to have specific learning on palliative care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and that's essential if our health professional students are going to develop as culturally responsive practitioners. Um, the focus of our um, toolkit will be um, that we'll have alignment of learning outcomes to our key national frameworks that support development of health professional graduate capabilities. Um, we're going to present it as a toolkit, which allows educators to plan and provide individualised learning. Um, we're currently in the process of collating content and resources, and we expect that to be finalised in September. And then we will be um, commencing a peer review process as part of our um, quality approach with Indigenous leaders and academics. So if you are interested or you can recommend someone who might be interested in being one of our peer reviewers, uh, then we'd really love it if you got in touch with us just through the PCC for you email, because um, we really would like to find um, some peer reviewers who have the um, experience and the capacity and the inclination to, um, to look at this resource for us and provide us with their feedback. In general, I know um, Steph wanted to just give us an update quickly on the skills IQ um, process. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yep, so just to let you know that the um, enrolled nurse toolkit for the Diploma of Nursing students, um, version three will be released um, very shortly. Uh, due, um, and that's um, in response to the unit of competency update. Um, and we are keeping a close eye on what's happening um, with our care worker toolkit as well related to um, the certificates in individual support and in age support as well. So um, just keep a close eye on the learning management system. And um, we will have new resources for you that you can implement to and ensure that you're up to date with the latest teaching packages. Hi, Nicole. Um, I've got a question. Uh, I've worked in aged care for a long, long time and I now train it. And um, I have um, looked after a number of um, Indigenous um, residents that have come into the facility. And uh, what I've found was that um, when the end of uh, the end of life 
um, slug terminal illnesses there and the, the end, of, end of their lifespan, I found that there was not enough information um, for the carers to be able to know how to care. That means any, anyone that's done the clinical part of it. And um, understanding then you said before that it's over 300 um, different cultures, you know, like a different um, aspects of Indigenous uh, Aboriginals in Australia. Um, how, how then can you then um, address the needs of that, that specific person that's going through and that family that's going through that, that uh, end of life um, stage in their, in their um, how, do, how do you go about that? In those situations, if, if, the, if the sick person can't sort of navigate a lot of this or speak on behalf of themselves, um, at IPEPA, we, we really promote family-centred care for community. So it, it really comes down to taking the entire family on the journey. Um, it, because every single, like you said, every single person um, is going to be different and their needs at the end of life is going to be as varied as what it is for any, for any one of us, um, no matter how we identify. Um, and I think it's important to, and, and I do come up against this a lot around people or mainstream um, health workers not understanding kinship structures. So when you do go to the family, it's really important to understand who you should be talking to um, because just in mainstream, you might assume that the next of kin might be blah, blah. But in Aboriginal communities, um, the community is structured in a completely different way. And it doesn't mean that a blood relative will be the one that is classified as family that will speak on behalf. Um, so when you're going in and looking about how you might support this person, the first thing that's important to identify is who you should be talking to um, when you talk to the whole family and, and who will be that person. And it, and it starts with having a family conference. Um, I find a lot of people benefit a lot in a two-way learning um, when they bring the whole family on board, even if it's for little things like building that trust relationship. Um, I know one person spoke of how amazing or how, how much it helped when, when a nurse put up on a whiteboard all of, everything about the medicines that they were giving um, their uncle and the uh, and all of the medicines that they were giving before, they, they didn't understand what they did. All they saw was um, stuff going into their uncle and him getting um, a, more and more um, vague and having negative kind of symptoms. They didn't understand that it was actually taking away pain. It was doing this, it was doing that. And um, that can start to build emotions for the family because they don't understand what's going on and if you don't know anything then fear starts particularly when you're involved with a system that's not your system so I encourage complete transparency in all of the care um, and that transparency has to go to all of the family because um, only by doing that will you better understand okay so when I take this whole family on a journey they will then identify the person that is will be the next of kin that you need to continue conversations with in, in how best to support this particular person that's sick. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Yes, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, Nick. And we've got one more question in the um, chat about balancing, how do you balance clinical not being as important as culture and choice when delivering info to clinicians as an advocate? I think she's just talking about balancing um, how some people might prioritise their um, clinical um, need or their physical needs lower than their cultural or spiritual needs at the end of life. Um, and how do you, I guess, balance that as, the, as a clinician? Well, there's no reason um, that they don't blend, you know, because we all want to be comfortable at the end of life. That's just a human thing, not necessarily a a cultural thing um, and, it, and it's also good for the family to make sure that they you know the people that they love is aren't in pain 
So I don't necessarily see that there's a difference. Where the difference is, is how you communicate that um, to the family. Um, and that's what's important is just transparency in everything that you do, because you need to remember what you represent. Um, you represent a system that is that has been racist, that has caused terrible experiences for these people, that has caused a lot of grief, loss and trauma. Um, so the onus is really on the system and yourselves to show and prove that you are not that system. Um, that's, where the, that's where your mind frame, I suppose, needs to be. You need to prove to our community in order to, to build that relationship and that trust, um, because the trust is just not there. Um, and that's based, unfortunately, on all of the experiences that have we have all collectively um, shared. Um, and yeah, and it's just it's through most communities. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nick. We might we will have to leave it there. Um, we really again appreciate your time and um, your input today, and, and so grateful for that. Um, well, so if anyone has any other questions, I also, there's an iPaper Facebook page, so feel free to shoot me anything through there as well. Yeah, great. We'll add that link to our webinar resources so people can find you easily. Awesome. So that's good. Thank you. Um, so we will be um, leaving it there today. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on the 17th of August, um, same Tuesday at 2 p.m., so um, we will be looking at using the PCC for you simulation resources then. Um, and yes, we hope we can see you there.